Hello students, welcome to part six of our chemistry series. And we are still focusing on organic compounds. In particular, we're going to talk about section 2.10, uh, all about proteins. Uh, so proteins contain, um, like many of the other biomolecules, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. They also contain nitrogen, and sometimes they will have sulfur and phosphorus in them. Um, they are polymers, um, so they are made up of a, all of these tiny little building blocks. Um, and for proteins, um, the monomer happens to be what we call amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acids. Um, they get joined by dehydration synthesis. Um, covalent, make covalent bonds, we call them peptide bonds between the amino acids. Um, uh, every amino acid has both an amine group, a nitrogen containing group, and an acid group. Um, so because they have the amine group, they can act as a base or they can act as an acid. All of the amino acids are identical except for something that what we, what we call the R group. Let's look at what that looks like. So here you can see your generalized structure for all of the different amino acids. Here's the acid group, here's the amine group, um, and here's what we call the R group. And you can see all of these different amino acids here, there's four examples here, have all the same kind of generic structure except what is attached to the carbon. Difference in that R, in that R group. And that's what makes each amino acid different from the other. And when the amino acids combine, um, if you get two amino acids, what we get is a dipeptide with a peptide bond between um, the amine group of one molecule and the acid group of another molecule. Um, and remember, we would do that through dehydration synthesis, the removal of water. Um, when we carry out hydrolysis on polypeptides or proteins, when we add water back in, we split that peptide bond and we get our amino acids back out at the end of it. Um, proteins are very complex structures um, and so generally we think of them in terms of levels of structure. Um, and I've got a couple of videos here um, which will help demonstrate those different things. Most proteins are folded into a complex globular shape each protein molecule consists of one or more chains of amino acid monomers. The amino acids are linked by peptide bonds, so a protein polymer is often called a polypeptide. Because they are so complicated, proteins are usually described in terms of four levels of structure. So four levels. The first of these is what we call primary structure. Each protein has a unique primary structure a particular number and sequence of amino acids making up the polypeptide chain. Twenty different amino acids are used to build proteins. Theoretically, the various amino acids could be linked in almost any sequence, forming an almost infinite variety of different proteins. This illustration shows some of the amino acids making up the primary structure of a protein. The structure of a single generalized amino acid is shown below. The main backbone of every amino acid is the same. This is what forms the backbone of the polypeptide chain. It is the R group which projects out from the backbone that makes each of the 20 kinds of amino acids unique. Different amino acids have different properties that affect the folding of a protein. Thus primary structure ultimately determines the shape of a protein which determines its function. Next is secondary structure. In most proteins, parts of the polypeptide chain are coiled or folded, forming twists and corrugations. This is secondary structure. The turns and folds of secondary structure contribute to the protein's overall shape. One kind of secondary structure is the alpha helix, where the chain twists. Another is the pleated sheet, where the chain folds back on itself or where two regions of the chain lie parallel to one another. Secondary structure results from hydrogen bonding between atoms along the polypeptide backbone. Oxygen and nitrogen atoms along the backbone exert a strong pull on electrons, giving them partial negative charges, and leaving nearby hydrogen atoms with partial positive charges. 
These negatively and positively charged atoms are attracted to one another at regular intervals along the chain, causing parts of the protein to twist or fold back upon itself. So here we go again. We have hydrogen bonds, intermolecular forces that are helping our proteins take shape. Uh, the next of our structural levels, oops, I think I went too far, is something that we call tertiary structure. Superimposed on primary and secondary structure is tertiary structure, irregular loops and folds that give the protein its overall three-dimensional shape. The irregular folding of tertiary structure results from interactions among the R groups of amino acids. Acidic and basic R groups ionize, and these positively and negatively charged groups may form ionic bonds. Polar forces also contribute to tertiary structure. Hydrophilic or polar R groups may hydrogen bond with one another or turn outward and hydrogen bond with the surrounding water. Hydrophobic, nonpolar R groups cluster on the inside of the protein away from water. Tertiary structure may be further stabilized by strong covalent bonds between sulfur atoms in certain R groups. The last of our structural levels is what we call quaternary structure. Some proteins consist of two or more polypeptide chains. The fourth level of protein structure, quaternary structure, results from the combination of two or more polypeptide subunits. Quaternary structure is stabilized by the same sorts of attractions that stabilize tertiary structure. Hemoglobin, the red oxygen-carrying protein of blood, is an example of a protein with quaternary structure. It consists of two kinds of polypeptide chains. Two of each, a total of four chains, make up each hemoglobin molecule. Okay, let's look at it all together. So here's our primary structure, the actual sequence of amino acids. This is what determines what type of protein it will become. Um, it is, um, if you change a particular amino acid, you then change the type of protein. Um, so the, uh, the proteins can't ever lose their primary structure. If they were to lose their primary structure, they would no longer be a protein. Um, secondary structure, the alpha helices and the beta sheets, uh, the pleated sheets here, these little zigzags um, being held together by hydrogen bonds. Um, on top of the primary and secondary structure is our tertiary structure, where the protein actually starts to fold in on itself and is held together by covalent bonds and ionic bonds and so on and so forth. At this level, tertiary structure, um, you now can have a functioning protein. Um, there is no functionality in secondary or primary structure, but in tertiary structure, um, now we do actually have um, some functionality. Um, as the video mentioned, there are some proteins that require not just a single polypeptide, but multiple polypeptides. And in that instance, if we have two or more of these polypeptides that get joined together, we are now at quaternary structure. And so primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Um, generally, we have two kind of major shapes of proteins. Uh, we have fibrous proteins and globular proteins. Fibrous proteins tend to be more structural in nature. They tend to have this kind of very stable, water-insoluble, kind of filamentous strand-like structure. Um, they tend to um, often have quaternary structure. Um, almost all of them will have at least tertiary structure. Um, so something like collagen, which is one of the primary um, and most prolific proteins in our body. Um, keratin is also a protein. Um, there are certain contractile proteins that are in our muscles that allow us to move, but they all generally have this kind of strand-like nature. Globular proteins tend to be more functional proteins. They get these kind of spherical shapes, globular shapes. Um, they are water soluble. Um, they will also have at least tertiary structure. Um, 
And this tends to be things like antibodies and hormones and enzymes because they tend to have what we call an active site, a specific functional region um, on the whole structure that allows it to carry out some sort of function. Um, the problem with increases in body temperature or decreases or even increases in pH is that because of this complex folding and this kind of very three-dimensional shape that these proteins must have in order to be functional, um, if they lose that shape, then those active sites are no longer there. Um, and then we can't do anything, um, it's no longer a functional protein. And we call that denaturation. Um, when a folded protein basically unfolds and loses all shape and becomes non-functional, um, then we no longer have a functional protein. That's what happens when we cook eggs. Um, albumin, the white of the egg, is a protein. And when you cook it, when you subject it to extreme high heat of the uh, pan on your stove, you unfold it and it loses its quaternary structure, it loses its tertiary structure, it loses its secondary structure. The only thing it keeps is that primary structure because literally that's the sequence of amino acids. Um, and so this is another reason we need to maintain a normal body temperature because if we don't maintain a normal body temperature, our proteins will start to denature. Um, and since proteins are both structural and functional in nature, um, they are a huge component to our body um, and we are really in big trouble if our proteins start to denature. Um, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the rate of chemical reactions, this idea of a catalyst. Um, particularly what we're talking about are specific globular proteins that we call enzymes, which increase the speed of the chemical reactions. They basically, what they do is lower the activation energy. They lower the energy required to make the reaction go. And that's what you're seeing here. Here's the activation energy to make this reaction occur. If the enzyme is around, it takes a lot less energy. Usually it does so by kind of lining up the reactants in a proper form or making a conducive environment for the reaction to occur. Practically every biochemical reaction in our body occurs with the use of an enzyme. Um, Without the enzymes, those reactions theoretically would still occur, but at such a slow speed that it cannot sustain life. Um, but with the advent and the introduction of our enzymes, these reactions can occur um, literally millions of reactions per minute in your body every second of every day, um, helped along by these enzymes. Um, so let's look at how that kind of works. For any reaction to occur, even one that releases energy, some energy must be added to get the reaction going. This energy is needed to break bonds in the reactant molecules. The energy needed to start a chemical reaction is called the energy of activation, Ea. This required energy input represents a barrier that prevents even energy-releasing reactions from occurring without some added energy. How does a living cell overcome the energy barrier so that its metabolic reactions can occur quickly and precisely? A special kind of protein called an enzyme is the answer. An enzyme serves as a biological catalyst, increasing the rate of a reaction without being changed into a different molecule. An enzyme does not add energy to a reaction. Instead, it speeds up a reaction by lowering the energy barrier. An enzyme is very selective. Its three-dimensional shape allows it to act only on specific molecules, referred to as the enzyme's substrates. As the substrates bind to the enzyme's active site, they are held in a position that facilitates the reaction. This takes less activation energy than the unaided reaction. Products form and are released. The enzyme emerges unchanged from the reaction. Because of the specific fit between enzyme and substrate, each enzyme can catalyze only one kind of reaction involving specific substrates. 
thousands of different enzymes may be required to carry out all of a cell's metabolic processes. For any reaction to occur, I want to go to the next slide. All right. So as the video says, they are all of the enzymes are substrate specific. Um, they are only going to carry out one particular type of reaction, um, or help carry out one particular type of reaction with a particular type of substrate. Um, many enzymes have what we call a cofactor, which is often um, a metal ion, uh, maybe like uh, magnesium. Um, or manganese um, or zinc. Um, they might even have a coenzyme, um, something like a vitamin. Um, it's one of the reasons we need vitamins so much. They often work and help our enzymes along. Um, anytime you see the prefix ACE, ACE, ASE, um, we are talking about an enzyme. And so we always name that enzyme um, kind of based on the reaction that it catalyzes. So um, a, hydral a hydrolase enzyme um, catalyzes a hydrolysis reaction. An oxidase enzyme catalyzes an oxidation reaction. Um, and like all catalysts, the enzymes are not consumed by the reaction. They come out of the reaction um, ready to go again in the same shape. Um, so let's look, look at what that kind of looks like. So here's our enzyme. Here, as you can see, it's active site where it's going to bind its substrates. When those substrates bind, we now have what we call the enzyme substrate complex. This is a temporary joining. You can see it kind of keeps the amino acids in this instance um, in the proper kind of position for the reaction to occur. Um, the enzyme itself might undergo some shape changes temporarily um, in order to facilitate that reaction. Um, and then the product will be released and the enzyme is back to its initial shape, ready to go again and ready to catalyze uh, another kind of round of this reaction. Um, these are incredibly, incredibly vital. Um, without enzymes, um, pretty much nothing in our body would work properly. Um, that is the end of the protein lecture.